Hi, everyone. Hi, can you hear us okay at the back? Oh. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, thank you so much for everybody squeezing in. Um, clearly a bit of an oversubscribed session, but we're so thankful that you're, you're here. And uh, yeah, hopefully you enjoy this talk. Awesome. So uh, we start with a quick intro. Uh, I'm Nico, I work for iSurveillance. Well, Dan and Ami work for iSurveillance, the creators of Cilium, and I'm a senior staff technical marketing engineer. Dan? Uh, yeah, uh, so my name is Dan Finneran. I'm part of the community team focusing on open source, so Cilium, eBPF. Uh, largely find me at the Cilium booth in the project pavilion for any other questions that you may have later on. Awesome. Um, so why are we here? We're here to answer uh, a quick question. Now, look at this and tell me, is this you? <laughs> uh, people are not raising your hands. You're all Kubernetes networking experts. You can come on stage now. No, <laughs> no um, Kubernetes networking is hard. I'm like uh, a network. I've been in networking for about 20 years and I still find it really scary, intimidating, and we're here to help you uh, understand, make the most of it, and maybe explain why Cilium is the answer. <laughs> so Dan is going to start by explaining why Kubernetes networking is so hard, uh, and he's going to try to explain Kubernetes networking without any of the jargon, any acronyms, or very few acronyms, we'll try. Definitely going to fail. <laughs> and, uh, and it really talk about, you know, what is the network um, meant to do? What do we need the network to do for our Kubernetes cluster? And again, explain some of the uh, reasons why Cilium has become the de facto Kubernetes networking platform. And uh, we'll, we'll do a demo later on, and we we'll talk about the newly announced and released Cilium Certified Associate Certification, and uh, you know, take a few questions if we have the chance. Now, Dan, good luck. <laughs> Merci. <laughs> so, uh, Kubernetes networking, not a small topic, but we're going to try and cover it as quickly as we can, and as mentioned, with uh, minimal jargon and no acronyms. So, uh, as Nico mentioned, networking is a tough subject, um, and Kubernetes doesn't really help uh, with that. So, out of the box, Kubernetes doesn't even provide any networking. If you've been using EKS, AKS, et cetera, you probably have just been using clusters without kind of having to worry about these sorts of things. But if you spin up a cluster by yourself, a lot of things don't come out of the box, and networking is one of those things. And it kind of gets even worse. So. Kubernetes networking introduces a whole other network that exists within the cluster itself. So you have the underlying network, and now you have this new network that exists within your Kubernetes cluster. Um, so, you know, kind of why are we here? What are we wanting to talk about? A little bit is, you know, why these things exist and how we can use them and how they all hang together. So one of the design principles of Kubernetes is kind of isolation of workloads. Things are generally encapsulated and hidden away as best as possible from the infrastructure. So your applications typically will live within this new network. Um, you know, applications that you deploy typically will live in this new network, which is commonly referred to as the pod network, and that's the, uh, you know, the, the embedded network that exists within your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, I have here is specified as a CIDA, so that's the first acronym that I've already shot myself in the foot with. Um, it's basically a different network range that exists within the cluster that should be separate from anything external. And this pod network, the things that run within this Kubernetes network should ideally not really be directly connectable. So you don't directly access, in most circumstances, pods directly. We, we need to have a way of exposing those things that are running within that network. Um, and all of this has introduced a few problems. Namely, who owns this network? Um, we're starting to find a little bit now that things are maturing, people are deploying more and more things. And you know, the networking team who've commonly been looking after switches and cabling and routing are now being asked to debug or manage these Kubernetes networks that they had no hand in creating or architecting or designing. 
and uh, don't really understand you know, why, why they exist, who put this there, and things like that. Ultimately, again, you know, what tools do they, they have to, or what tools does any of us have in order to understand, diagnose, debug um, this Kubernetes network? How do we observe the network? How do we understand any bottlenecks or anything that's kind of performance impacting? And finally, you know, how do we enforce any control over this network? Typically before, we would use firewalls and we would have various things that would plug into the network to allow us to understand and enforce that. Again, we've got this new black box network that nobody understands and are being asked to manage, et cetera. So with this, we're gonna step through Kubernetes network in terms of what it looks like uh, from two standpoints. One from an architectural standpoint and then two from the standpoint of the application developer and deployer. So these are kind of core requirements for Kubernetes networking. Pods need to be able to speak to each other. So we have our Kubernetes cluster made of multiple nodes. We have the network that exists within that Kubernetes cluster. And we have multiple applications that are deployed within pods. Pods will need to speak to each other as if they're directly on the same, uh, well, pods will need to speak to each other regardless of where they live. So, pardon me. So that, that means that we'll need a mechanism of moving traffic between the nodes and then sending it back to the pod as if everything was all on the same flat network. We need to access those applications. So as I mentioned, these pods that we have running within that network, we shouldn't really be accessing them directly. So we need a way of getting traffic into our cluster, into that cluster network, and then onto the pods themselves. And we typically do that by exposing things through uh, Kubernetes services. So a service is accessed in a number of different ways, either internally, so you may want to access uh, pods that sit underneath uh, a service internally, but in most cases, we'll want to access it from outside the Kubernetes networking cluster. So we do that in two, uh, two common ways. One is to expose a port on all of the servers that are part of that cluster, so that's a node port. So anything that accesses any of those servers on that port will go to that service, will go to the pods that sit underneath that service. Additionally, we, we may use a load balancer service and that will create a new address on the network um, with a port attached to it. When we access that IP address on the network, traffic is then routed into the service and then sits and accesses the pods behind it. So this is how we tend to get traffic into a Kubernetes cluster. So that's coming in. What about traffic going out? And this can cause uh, headaches in a certain way, but in most circumstances, um, pods that are running within a Kubernetes cluster, when they send traffic out, the endpoint that you're accessing um, won't see the traffic coming from the pod itself. So you won't get, you know, it's not direct access to the pod. So how does traffic work, work in both directions? Well, in most circumstances, we will NAT, or we will effectively change the destination address that the traffic came from to be the address of where the pod was running. So as far as whatever it is that you're accessing is concerned, the traffic came from the machine where the pod was actually running. That means the traffic can go back to that machine and then go to that pod where it's actually uh, up and running. And as your pods are rescheduled, um, they will go to other machines and the, uh, the source address for where they came from will change to where that is actually, uh, up and running. That's fantastic in most circumstances, but there are issues with that. Um, if you have thousands of nodes and you are trying to access something that, that is behind a firewall, then you're gonna to need to have a lot of rules in that firewall because you have no idea where that pod is actually going to be running, rendering your firewall largely pointless at this point. So um, in order to kind of get around that, we have the concept of egress gateways and how that typically tends to work is traffic is funneled to the egress gateway and then the traffic will go from that egress gateway to wherever it's going to the outside world. So regardless now of where your pod is actually up and running, it doesn't make a difference if it's on node one or node 1000. As far as whatever you're accessing is concerned, it's all coming through that egress gateway with that permanent looking uh, IP address. So that's kind of the architectural standpoint of traffic inside the cluster, traffic coming into the cluster and traffic coming out of the cluster. Um, we need to kind of look at now how application users typically will use those architectures to get traffic to their applications that are running. Um, so first kind of requirement is we want to secure our traffic that's running within our Kubernetes cluster. 
Out of the box, there is no rules within a Kubernetes cluster about what can access what. So all of your pods can speak to all of your pods within a, all of your other pods within a Kubernetes cluster. So in order to secure that, we have the concept of network policies. And a network policy can kind of enforce uh, which pod can speak to which other pods, which pods can speak to which other services, um, and what we can speak to coming outside of the, uh, the machine as well. So we can have rules internally in a number of different places. And they're analysis, uh, you know, kind of analogous to firewall rules effectively, but they're known as Kubernetes networking policies. We also may need to have things like encryption. So for instance, as I mentioned, when pods speak to other pods and they're on different nodes, traffic's going to need that, leave that node, go onto the underlying network, uh, traverse the network, go to the node where the pod is actually running, and traffic will get to the, their end-to-end. -end. If we don't control that underlying network, we don't know who may have access to it. They may be able to sniff that traffic and things like that. So we may want to encrypt that traffic should it go on to an unsecure network when it needs to go to a different node. And then finally, accessing. So we, I'm, we already mentioned things like node ports and load balancers, um, very simplistic. You know, layer two, layer three access, uh, layer three, layer four access into our applications. Um, there are more common uh, use cases or more advanced use cases even that people may require. And we tend to look at that through things like ingress controllers. So an ingress controller uh, will be running within your Kubernetes cluster. It will be given uh, an accessible address on the network. And when traffic comes into that ingress controller, we can look at what's actually happening so in this example, we can see we're accessing our ingress controller as, uh, as a web service. And we can see here, we're hitting the, uh, the IP address of the web service and we're passing the path slash yellow. Now the ingress controller can be configured then to look at the path that we're actually specifying and determine the traffic then should go to this service and this selection of pods that sit underneath it. Likewise, if we configure a rule for the path red, then it shall go to a different service. And ingress controls are typically how you manage multiple services that are all being kind of web facing. That's typically been done through the concept of ingress controllers and the ingress type objects within the Kubernetes uh, object types and things like that. We're now moving towards a uh, technology or a new technology, a new project in the Kubernetes space, which is called Gateway API. The main reason for this is to pretty much standardize across the, all of the different networking types how we access things within a Kubernetes cluster. So it will handle things like t uh, HTTP routes, like we just mentioned before. So you'll create a, a HTTP route for slash yellow, for instance, and that will uh, work in the exact same way that the ingress uh, originally would have done before. But later down the line, there's gonna be things like TCP and UDP routes, which will be kind of comparable to the service type load balancer. And there's gonna be more routes that are being added as well. So Gateway API is pretty much the future for Kubernetes networking um, moving forward. So that's Kubernetes networking explained as quickly as I could. And I'm going to hand you over to Nico. So if we had to summarize, um, you know, what do we need the network to do, right? And um, we need the network, the applications to have accessible IP addresses. We need them to be able to talk with each other. We need to set up um, outbound access. We need to you know, let them access the outside network. And likewise, we need to be able to bring traffic to them. Um, we need our applications secured. We need to provide some load balancing, make the applications resilient. Uh, we may need to uh, meet some regulatory compliance and encrypt the traffic. And finally, we might need to operate and troubleshoot them. And you know, all this is like, I've not mentioned the word pods or anything. These are common networking tenants that uh, must be applied regardless of the compute that uh, you have in your, you know, whether it's virtual machine, bare metal, pods, uh, all these are things that we need the network to do. Um, but in Kubernetes, in Kubernetes, it means that you need uh, a CNI to provide the connectivity, the pure connectivity, uh, giving an IP address to your pods and making sure they're able to talk to each other. We also need to provide the load balancing. We need to do things like um, the security and the network policies. 
we need to encrypt the traffic and um, we need the ingress controller or gateway API. Finally, we need to connect multiple clusters together, maybe do some load balancing across them, use them for high, uh, high availability and resiliency. And you can see my, uh, you know, PowerPoint skill set here, but, and it's making up, uh, and finally the last piece of the puzzle is the network observability, right? And all of this is- That's beautiful. <laughs> is, is, is Cilium, right? Um, which is now the only CNCF uh, project in the graduated category in the cloud native networking. So I think we can say humbly that it uh, becomes a de facto Kubernetes networking layer. Um, and if you've been running Kubernetes cluster for a few years now, uh, you probably have accumulated a set of tools in your environment. You know, maybe you've yeah, used a CNI for the network policy support. Maybe you added an ingress to bring the traffic into your cluster. Maybe you have QProxy. Maybe you have a service mesh for maybe encryption or observability. Maybe you have something like Metal LB for load balancing or for to assign IP addresses. And I, I don't know about you, but many people I talk to have tool fatigue. Right? They're just kind of struggling with maintaining, operating so many different tools. Now, what we would advise, recommend you to, for maybe your next cluster is start with Cilium, deploy Cilium, and you don't have to enable all the features, right, from, from day one, um, but Cilium can do all these things, right? This, so you may not need to deploy some of the tools, and, but just deploy them as you need when, uh, for example, when Cilium doesn't support a feature. And what supports all this is eBPF. Cool. So I'm not allowed to talk about this for too long because I can and will talk at you for hours about eBPF. Um, who in the room has heard of it? Uh, you may have been wondering why there's bees everywhere, but have you, who's, who's heard of eBPF in the room? Yeah, quite a few people. Has anybody written an eBPF? Whoa, I did not expect that. So um, eBPF is effectively the technology that is everything that Cilium related is built upon. Um, we use eBPF to control how the traffic moves around within a running machine. We use it to control the behaviors of that traffic, to load balance the traffic. We use it to control network policies. EBPF effectively allows us to reprogram a running machine and do what we want it to do. So um, EBPF is the foundational layer of everything Cilium related. That's Cilium itself as a CNI. That's Hubble being able to provide that observability. Uh, and Tetragon, which we're not really going to have time to cover today, but to, we use Tetragon sitting on top of EBPF to control what can and can't happen on a running system. So yeah, eBPF is the secret source for everything Cilium-wise. But do you need EB to know eBPF to use Cilium? No, yeah. but I would advise learning it because I think it's fantastic. Yeah. But, yeah. It's, the reason why we're not really gonna delve into it is it's quite complex. It's very low level kernel programming, so you don't need to know about it. We have taken care of all of that for you. But if you do want to learn about it, then there's a lot of resources out there, and um, Liz will be signing a book at 6 p.m. at the ice surveillance stand later about her book about eBPF. <laughs> Fantastic. So we are going to start seeing uh, Cilium in action. Um, I guess the, so probably the, the two core use cases that people use Cilium for to begin with is around the support for the network policies to secure the cluster and for the observability, and I'll start with that. And then I'll show you some uh, gateway API support. Um, but again, network policies tend to intimidate, intimidate a lot of people. Um, again, I don't think we explain it in, in simple terms, so I'll try to do that. If you look at the uh, network policies, and you'll see a lot of our uh, documentations, labs are around the Star Wars themes. If you don't like Star Wars, don't worry, I won't. you don't have to know it. Um, but a network policy is essentially based around a couple of you know, blocks and fields. 
First, you need to decide, work out who this policy applies to, right? There's just, and it's using selectors, you can use labels, and say this network policy will only apply to uh, a pods with this specific label. So it's only going to be applied to my desktop. Then you decide in which direction uh, does this policy apply to. So it's an ingress network policy. So this traffic, it's a rule that uh, looks at um, the traffic to the pod. Um, and then you just define, you know, from who, right? So here we only allowing uh, access to the Death Star from the TIE Fighter over pod 80. It's simple. And this one is another one in the other direction. Again, it's the same, same structure, right? So who the policy applies to, it applies to uh, my TIE Fighter, and it's the traffic leaving the TIE Fighter and going to, um, well, it can go to um, the, whoops, <laughs> here we go, the, the Disney.com uh, API. So one thing that the Cilium network policy can do is um, filter based on the domain name. It's not something you have in the Kubernetes network policy. Right? That's something that many users would, would want to, to use Cilium network policies for, is for the support for the domain name um, uh, filtering. And we are allowing traffic to the, uh, to the Death Star, again, over port 80. Um, again, you know, hopefully simple enough to understand. So let's start with the demo. Demo time. All right. Right, can um, everybody see this? Okay. Yeah. Right, so it's, uh, I've got here is uh, one of our uh, hands-on labs uh, there. You can find them on isovelon.com slash labs, uh, free labs that you can access. We have about, I think, 33 now that uh, let you test different use cases, features of Cilium, Tetragon, Hubble. Um, so here I've got my, uh, my cluster, which is um, running Cilium. Let's have a look here. It's running Cilium uh, 114, and it's on the um, Kubernetes cluster running Kine. We've got three nodes, uh, and everything is healthy. And I'm using the Cilium status. So Cilium is, so I'm using the Cilium CLI, which is a binary that comes with Cilium that lets you uh, check the status of Cilium, uh, change the configuration, etc. So uh, Cilium is, uh, my environment is healthy, and I've uh, deployed uh, a demo app, and we're just going to go and check here. Um, so uh, I've deployed a namespace, Endor, like the Endor moon, and I've got a, a Death Star, a TIE Fighter, an X-Wing, uh, and what I want to prevent with my network policies is the X-Wing to blow up the Death Star, right? So we're going to implement some network policies to do that. Um, so I've actually deployed the network policy I showed you before. And if I try to uh, access the... Um, the Death Star from the TIE Fighter. So I'm, you know, I'm running a, a shell in my TIE Fighter and then connecting, you can see I'm going uh, to my Death Star service in the Endor namespace, uh, then uh, slash V1 slash request landing. So you can see the full path here. And you can see my ship, my ship has landed, right? So access was successful. Um, the TIE Fighter was able to um, uh, access the Death Star. Now, from the X-Wing, it times out because I've applied a network policy to block that traffic. The only traffic which was allowed 
was uh, from the pods with the labels um, uh, Empire, if you recall, in my network policies, I had a, I was matching based on the labels. Um, and my TIE Fighter uh, is not part of the, uh, my X-Wing is not part of the Empire, it's part of the Alliance, the Rebel Alliance, and therefore access is denied. Now, I can actually even check with our observability tool, because when you deploy your network policy, and you know it's natural to make mistakes at first, or maybe you have some, you've had some security issues. You want to be able to, or connectivity issues. You want to be able to verify uh, access and network connectivity. And and for this, we use Hubble. And Hubble is a tool that comes with with Cilium. That's the kind of observability layer. It's kind of like um, like TCP dump before Kubernetes or NetFlow for Kubernetes. Um, so what I can do is I can look for, the command I've just run is Hubble Observe, and I'm looking for all the traffic from my pod in the namespace and or uh, my X-Wing uh, um, pod to my uh, Death Star pods in the namespace and or, and I'm looking for traffic that has been dropped. And you can see uh, that includes the traffic I've just uh, uh, generated before that. Um, and all this is kind of, again, built in. There's no, um, I've not had to instrument any of this in my, uh, in my applications. They are absolutely unaware of, uh, of this. And even better is Hubble comes with a user interface. Um, so if I look at my end or namespace, I can see how all my microservices are talking to each other. And I've not had to, um, do anything around uh, instruments, any of my applications. Right? This was done, built automatically for me. So I can see that my, uh, uh, again, my TIE fighter, uh, where, you know, try to access the internet. I can even filter based on the traffic which was dropped. So all my uh, X-Wing traffic was dropped, um, whereas my um, TIE fighter is able to access the desk star as I want to. Right. Again, that comes out of the box, nothing for you to do. Cool, anything else you want to? Uh... No, I just think, you know, it's fantastic that it actually tells you that it's the network, that a network policy has actually caused this, because um, so easy to kind of get things wrong sometimes in a Kubernetes cluster. Being a, a YAML warrior is, is all well and good until you misspell something, and then you've no idea why anything isn't working. So getting, all of this information at your fingertips is uh, fantastic for troubleshooting and observing what's actually happening. Um, and the last thing I add on the, on the Hubble UI is also gives you visibility at the layer seven. So it's not kind of just layer three, layer four. It shows you the, the path. So if you recall, when I did my, uh, my curl, it was to a slash v1 slash request landing. And I can see this exactly uh, in, in this. And again, I've not had to implement a, a service mesh or any other tool to be able to get that visibility at the layer seven, which is super useful if you're you know, using APIs and you just want to see traffic uh, between all your different services. Cool, so that's uh, demo one. And then, how are we doing time-wise? Okay, so I'll be quick. So um, what we uh, also wanted to show you is a Cilium support for the gateway API. Uh, which again comes built in. You don't need to kind of install another ingress controller, another tool. Cilium includes uh, a gateway API compliant with a uh, recent version, which is 1.0. So supports a, a ton of use cases. So for example, and, and Dan kind of show you how if you, um, it's kind of a, like a reverse proxy. If you say you make a curl uh, command to slash foo, it will send this to the foo service. If you do it to slash bar, we'll send it to the bar service. If you want to use gRPC instead, um, the Cilium Gateway API can route gRPC requests directly to your gRPC services. Uh, if you've decided to move a service um, and migrate a service, you can use Cilium to do redirection. So if, you're try if you have a user who's trying to access the old domain, you can send a 302 redirection code back to the user uh, to, to tell them where to go. 
And the other thing I'm going to show you now is uh, load balancing, right? So you can actually use um, Cilium to do built-in um, load balancing, traffic splitting between, you know, for canary uh, testing for A, B uh, applications. So you could say, I want 99% of that traffic to go towards this application, this service, and only 1% to go towards you know, a new version of your application. And again, that's built in in Cilium. Um, all right, let's go to demo. Uh, I will take a, a second or so. Here we go. So here what I've got is um, um, I've deployed a, a gateway. Um, um, and I've deployed a, uh, a gateway which has picked up an IP address. You can see the 255.201. And it has received an IP address. Again, this is Cilium has assigned an IP address. There's no metal LB in here. Um, and my gateway is listing for traffic on 443. And it's set up in TLS termination. So the traffic from the outside client to my gateway is over HTTPS. And then the traffic from the gateway to the internal service is over port 80. We also support TLS path through where the whole traffic is uh, encrypted. So what we're also doing is we've got a gateway API route. And again, it's attached to my Cilium gateway. And, and right now, all the traffic is going to go to my death DAO service. So if I go and try this, right, you can see my, if I do a curl from outside the cluster into this, my gateway IP address, um, I get a successful reply. I can, and I'm, I'm just collecting some information about my, my death DAO. I can see how many passengers are on the death DAO. Um, the length and uh, the cost. Uh, but what you can also see is the host name. So I can see the name of the pod. So it's a kind of an echo server. It, it replies back with the name of itself. Um, so we're just going to uh, do a quick... Um, uh, so the scenario here is, okay, I'm introducing a new application of the Death Star because Death Star is often very insecure. It gets blown up by the rebels. So you want to uh, have a more secure Death Star. So I'm adding a Death Star, Death Star V2 here. Um, but I've not, I've not done any load balancing yet. So if I run a loop, I can see how many um, requests still go to the new Death Star and to the old star, as you can see, I, could, I, can, I know the source, uh, the pod that is receiving my request. So I'm just going to go and we go. So we're going to see, so 200 queries went to the old death star and zero went to the new one. So now I'm going to start doing some introduce uh, traffic to my new death star. So what we're doing here is we've got some weight. So 90% of the traffic will go to my old star, 10% will go to my new one. And again, we'll run the same kind of traffic uh, generation and we'll go and verify that it's pretty much, you know, one, one for 10 um, has been sent to, uh, to my new star. All right. There. Right, roughly 15, 15. So um, Cilium is, again, we've not had to deploy any um, other tools to support this functionality. So Cilium is, Cilium is much more than just um, a CNI. Right, so um, we are almost running out of time. Um, <laughs> The, we've just we've been working very closely with the CNCF on a new certification uh, called the Cilium Certified Associate, which is the entry level certification 
you can see here some of the domains and areas that are part of the blueprint. Things around you know, network policy, uh, you know, around the architecture of how Ethereum uh, builds these kind of networks. Um, and a few questions around uh, multiple cluster connectivity with cluster mesh and, uh, and BGP. Uh, and I've got a session tomorrow at the C um, CNCF Learning and Training Lounge, if you want, it's at 3 p.m., I think. Additionally, as well, there's going to be learning guides that are being written as we speak. Um, so the learning guides plus all of the labs are effectively a fantastic way for you to learn all about both Kubernetes networking and Cilium networking, and it will help you pass the CCA exam if that's a thing that would uh, be interesting to you. So if you want to go and do some of our labs, you get some of the badges, but like I said, we've got over 30 odd uh, badges, uh, labs available. Uh, you can find us at the Isovenant Labs, and I will leave you with a feedback if you have any questions. Uh, again, thank you very much for joining us. Much we do actually have a couple of minutes uh, if you do have any questions, and there is a microphone moving around. So if anybody does have any questions, please let us know. No? <laughs> Does, uh, does the Cilium support IPv6 fully? Yes. Cilium supported IPv6 before it supported IPv4, funnily enough. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Pardon. So a quick question, quick question. So assuming that I want to um, implement only the encryption, the, the mesh basically, um, but I don't want to change the, the Nginx that I currently have um, as part of my um, um, API gateway or yeah. ingress controller, yeah. right? So the question is, can I have um, that without replacing Nginx, but I still want um, the traffic from the Nginx going to the pod encrypted. Yeah, you can, you can pick and choose with Cilium. Uh, so the question is, can I still use my Nginx ingress controller, uh, but get some of the connectivity benefits from Cilium? Yes, absolutely. Um, like I said, you can just, you don't have to activate all the, fe the features from Cilium, um, but you can just use for pure connectivity. More questions specifically for Nico? <laughs> yeah, well, well, I was wondering how you handle the bandwidth and the supervision of the bandwidth, and do you have a system to uh, balance that? On the, do you have a system for, to manage the bandwidth? Yeah, yeah. for instance, if uh, you have all your pod and then all the, the works goes there, and so you want to spread your pod in order to spread the, the network uh, consumption. Um, Yes, yeah, Cilium is, um, includes a, a load balancer. Uh, by default, it's well, for any of the kind of services, Cilium will load balance the traffic. Um, we also have a, if we're just talking about our bandwidth, we also have a, a way to limit the bandwidth of a pod. That's also another feature that comes with Cilium, which we'll not talk about today, called the bandwidth manager. And I think that's probably the only CNI that supports it. So if you want to control the traffic, uh, and prevent like bandwidth starvation, Cilium is also capable of doing that. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you, you present um, external load balancing, and uh, if you want to manage another protocol that HTTP, uh, can we with Cilium? So, um, protocols that are supported are pretty much defined by the Kubernetes objects itself. So Kubernetes itself will do TCP, UDP, and SCTP. Those are the three protocols that services inside Kubernetes are aware of. Um, yes, yeah, so that's, that's mainly it. Okay. Do I have questions? Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I have a question regarding uh, the egress gateway. 
I have a setup, obviously. I would like to receive traffic and direct it to a service by the egress gateway IP address. Is that possible? So that's traffic coming out of the cluster and then going back in again? Correct. Uh, yes, yes. So Is it possible? Uh, ooh. Well, there's a, a feature coming out. I don't know if it's in the enterprise open source, but where you can use egress gateway with BGP. So BGP could advertise your egress gateway IPs mm. and, and therefore this would enable you to access the egress yeah. gateway. So traffic will go in both directions through the same IP. That would be brilliant, you know, because we're something that we actually need at the moment. Uh, we're actually using the, the, the egress gateway, obviously, because we need to control the destination IP address for the pods, but we really want the traffic to come in on the same uh, IP address, you know? Got it, yeah. So. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's just on the enterprise version, but I can I can. Do ah. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, I've been informed that that's it for questions. We've been kicked out of this room for the next session. Thanks. Thank you, anybody who's still about. And uh, yeah, we'll be about at the ice surveillance and the Cillian booths if you have any further questions. Thanks, everyone.